Hi, and welcome to another episode of Tom Ray's Art Podcast. I'm Tom. On today's show, I meet an author and a publisher. The person started working for a publishing company in uh, another state and then decided to go off and start their own. But at the same time, they were also an author. So not only do they produce their own books and publish them and found ways to distribute them and go through publishers, but they also do this for other authors. And they have a site and a store and everything that they do this on. So we talk about what it's like to run your own business that actually involves other creators and also creating your own stuff and finding the time for all this. And to tell you the truth, the person is putting out a lot of books in the next couple of years and it's all planned out. It's a great conversation. It's a lot of insight uh, that's really helpful in looking at what it's like to be on both sides of the creative aspect of things. So here's my interview starting right now. I'm Rod R. Garcia. I'm an author a publisher. I have a small publishing company. Um, got started out in Hollywood years ago and um, very happy to be here. Okay. And where, where are you located <laughs> right now? Uh, Star Valley, Arizona, about okay. uh, 70-ish miles north of Phoenix, up in the mountains, getting okay. snow. How did you get there? For, so how did you were in California and then now yep. you're there? Why, why the change? Like is one, is there a huge weather difference between the two, by the way? Uh, Star Valley and, and Phoenix itself. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we're at 5,000 feet. So, uh, we're generally 20 degrees cooler than, um, than Phoenix during the summertime. And we actually get snow in the winter. So, uh, a couple of years ago, um, the, and it was just before we moved in, but our next door neighbors said they were snowed in for 18 days straight. No. This guy has a big truck, so he goes out in, in everything, but he said that they couldn't leave for 18 days. So yeah, we get some interesting weather up here. Okay. See, I would, I would not have expected that. I'm, I, I just assume everywhere else in the world is warm and we're the only place that gets snow, but I know that's not true, you know, up here in Wisconsin. I, I, I realize I'm just boohooing myself, but you know, you get more ice. <laughs> that's, that's true. <laughs> I guess so. And then, so you said you, st you had a, a publishing company, you said, right? I do. Yeah. So, th yeah. so tell me about that. Well, um, a little backstory. I, I've, uh, I worked as a, I worked for a, uh, a literary agency for years. So I got a little background there. I was, uh, between being a literary agent and, uh, and gosh, I was, I would screen the screenplays as they would come through and the manuscripts. So I, I had a lot of, um, thumbs in the pies as the, as it were, okay. um, when it comes to the industry itself. Um, in the, in 2013, I actually, uh, co-authored with another, another author, a book that got published through a small publisher was uh, underwhelmed with how it went. Uh, it wasn't that they were bad. It was just fairly hands off and it was just very indie publisher in that respect. Um, you know, I mean, and again, which is most of them, it's not that mm -hmm. they were doing something bad. It's just how it, the, the most of the the small publishers handle things so like i say it just it, it didn't go the way i really hoped it would so um i kind of threw the writing aside for a while and in 2016 i opened uh or established epiphany mill publishing with the idea that i would help authors much more hands-on take on fewer authors and give them a better chance at success and not really having to go through that. Well, I got published and nothing happened and really kind of throwing in the towel out of disappointment, if that makes sense. Yeah. What, is, what does it entail to start one of those? Uh, well, for us, it was, I had to, and I suppose not everybody does this, but I really, I wanted to do it all the way. So I, okay. of course you find a distributor, you make sure you've got someone who's going to distribute the books properly for you, uh, who prints and distributes, uh, globally. Yeah. So I go through Ingram, um, which is, they're, they're fantastic. They've, they really grew a lot through the whole COVID thing. It was interesting. They had to shut down operations because obviously they couldn't bring people in to print, and just going straight ebooks really wasn't an option for them. So things really slowed down on their end. So they have that impacted a lot of their operations and they grew from it, which was great. So I'm really? glad I was with them to begin with. Um, yeah, their offerings on how they bi offer business. I mean, if there's anybody else out there who's looking for a distributor, Ingram has been fantastic. And I don't get paid for saying that or anything. They've just right. been really good to us. If you do, you'd um, have to give me some. 
because there you go. Show. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> well, I give you the links. Yeah. There you um, go. <laughs> so, uh, but uh, and then we actually got established with uh, the uh, Library of Congress. So every every one of the books that we publish actually ends up oh, with yeah, the Library of Congress. That. that has okay, an yeah. number. <laughs> and uh, we had to purchase all of the ISBN numbers up front and barcodes, and so there was a lot of an investment that that went into it. Yeah. Um, plus wanting to be a traditional publisher and not um not one of the vanity presses that that says hey you know you pay us this much and we'll get you out there um we didn't want that road at, route at all so we also cover like artwork and everything so finding um reliable artists yeah um and that's difficult too artists uh and and not you know again not to uh poo-poo artists, but um, there's a lot of people in the in the art community who are really kind of getting by by the skin of their teeth and don't have a lot of time to put into it. And you doing an art podcast, I'm sure you get this. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of projects that get started that just don't get completed. So finding someone who was dedicated and willing to complete things in a certain amount of time was not easy either. Yeah. Well, and also book genres, I'm learning just from messing around with, you know, I, I put out books just cause I'm like, well, oh, I want to try and see what it's like. And I just self publish my own stuff. I'm not doing it like going, this is going to be my path. It's just something I do because I'm doing web comics and I'm like, well, this is an option. It's just kind of like a band releasing their stuff on Bandcamp. It's like, no, we're not signed to a label, but we're able to get stuff out there to people and find For people sure. who are interested. And I've been yeah. messing around with it. And one of the things that I've learned uh, through, because you also do a deep dive, like going, how do you do this? How do you do that? And you just start looking stuff up online. And as far as artists for covers, like you're talking about, there's actually specificity in book covers. Like there are, yes. and, and you don't think of it, but it really is like, once I learned this, I'm like, oh, like this type of genre people have found, you know, they'll just go, oh, this is a really cool cover and I like it and it's great, but it'll be like, no, this genre actually has a specific type that people are attracted to or they're used to seeing. Like it'll be, uh, whether it's romance novels or whether it's like uh, mystery or detective novels, there's a specific like sort of layout and it's kind of like YouTube thumbnails. It's like, you know, the close up of the person smiling or the, ooh, what's this sort of thing. There's, there's a specific thing that draws in a genre of reader. And so even I when agree. you're finding artists, you have to find artists that get like, this is the layout for this type of book, this genre. So is, is that something that is easy to find when you're looking for artists too? Like, are you able to just tell them that? Or do you find artists that are like, oh yeah, I know what that is. I guess is what I'm asking. Well, and actually, no, that's an excellent question, actually. And it's it's something that I really, I mean, I've been through, but hadn't given really much thought to. It's just, it's part, it, it's been part of the process. But yeah. yes, I have one artist who is down in Brazil. The guy is fantastic. Okay. And, and he does photorealistic art. Um, I tasked him with doing a um, a more comic style art cover, you know, where it's, it's it was drawn characters. Um, and he did it. And did a good job with it, but let me know afterward. This is not my favorite type of work to do. <laughs> okay, um, it was a lot of characters, and it was all hand drawn stuff. Where he likes to do things, which is much more kind of working with Photoshop and creating photorealistic characters and such. So it just wasn't his style. So yeah. where he was willing to do it, I, I'd rather not put a good artist through. I'd rather have them do the things that they're good at and enjoy doing. That and, makes sense. Valid. Yeah. So, uh, so yeah, I, I, I found since then, I have found another, uh, artist who loves doing hand drawn character art is really good at it okay. and is now kind of redoing, we're reinventing the cover for that particular book and for the series that will follow it as well. But it's, uh, yeah, I, I think, and it's, there are a lot of artists who will say, I'll take on this art and I'll do it. But Honestly, I, I think it's just, it's no different than writing or any other art Yeah, to exactly. ask someone to do art that's outside of their, their interest, you know, yeah. I don't know. It, it's just, I found it so fascinating that there were specific type uh, types of cover layouts. And the thing is, is they're cover layouts for books that have no pictures in them, but the cover art has to be a certain way to indicate what type of, just that's how you tell what type of book it is just by looking at the cover, not even looking yeah. up the genre. It's like, you can tell when you see it, the most obvious one being yeah. the romance novels where it has the uh, hunky beefcake on the cover. But, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, and I actually talked to an author who does romance novels and I was just like, 
looking at her covers going, oh my, <laughs> I guess I know what it's kind steamy, of books right? you write. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, and one more, actually, sorry, one more uh, sp- uh, nerdy question about the publishing. You said that you purchased the oh. ISBN numbers. What's the deal with ISBN numbers? Why do you have to purchase them and why are they so expensive? What's I don't um, get that. They're basically social security numbers for a book. Really? And essentially the ISBN numbers are they indicate not just the the title but i have to have multiple isbn numbers for for titles that i put out so i have an isbn number for the paperback i have an isbn number for uh an ebook um for an audiobook i have a separate isbn number for that um there's a fourth isbn number that i've established for the most recent book that i've done called endgame uh-huh. and um that one is for library options so uh, for audio library so if a li- if a public library wants to carry it in their audio selection they can and there's a different purchase price for it there's different um regulations you know how they can use it and share it so the isbn number kind of includes all of that data in 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 addition to the information about the book itself i mean you can publish without them it just certainly adds right. some yeah a level yeah. of validity to it i think yeah it's it's like a uh i want to say a sign it's not a sign of prestige but it looks more like oh you have an isbn number you know or you know this could be scanned at a place and when they scan it they know that it'll instantly show up or they can put it in their inventory and all that kind of stuff yeah yep absolutely Um, so now moving on from okay that's enough publishing questions let's talk about you (laughs) uh so what, what what would you say the genre of books that you write are Currently, young adults, um, young, young adults. Adult okay. Yeah, um, young adults, sci-fi, dystopian. Uh, <laughs> okay. I'm a, a big fan of dystopian sci-fi, like Philip K. Dick and, uh, gosh, Michael Crichton. If you could put him into that, all right, uh, into the same range. So, s- more science fact in some in some regards, but uh, uh, you know, even Dean Roddenberry uh, writing Star Trek, I respected the way he handled it because he would always he had a group of people, uh, college professors mostly, that he would reach out to when he was writing and say, okay, uh, will this be possible one day? Not was, now, not, you know. I was just going to ask, do you do background? It sounds like you probably do. Like you make sure to check it. You don't just go, I heard this somewhere and this, uh, maybe I'll just elaborate on it uh, because it's a book and you yeah. can make it up. But you actually try to uh, somehow solidify it in actual science? Yes. Okay. I, I do a lot of research and, um, and in fact, I keep track of all the websites that I go to for actual research. So there's uh, there's a part toward the uh, the middle of this first book that I've just released um, where there's a lot of talk about the brain and the resilience of the brain and how nanotech could actually restore brain you know, neural you know neural pathways and such. Okay. And it's all real science. It's all stuff that's being that's being studied right now. So yeah. I try to keep things at least in a realm of possibility, if not probability. Okay. I do love a good nanotechnology story, to tell you the truth. I I find myself always being fascinated by it. And I know that it's been used in many different ways, comedically and also, you know, comic book wise and actual science, which I still, the actual, (laughs) the actual nanotechnology, I mean, I just picture as little crawling bugs that are tiny little robots that they made. I don't know what it actually is, but that's what my viewpoint is. And that's what I'm sticking with. Uh, <laughs> pretty much. Yeah. That's pretty much it. Yeah. Were you always writing this type of genre or did you eventually evolve into this type? I, you know, I kind of evolved into it. That's, okay. that's, that's another really good question. I, I did. I, and I write a lot of different things. I actually have a, a, and I call it psychological horror, but with a SCI, like sci fi. So I call it my psychological horror. But okay. It's, uh, nice. It's called Iteration. And um, it's, it's definitely on the horror uh fringe but it's okay it's one of those that i um i push aside now and then because the character is very dark and i (laughs) it's harder going there with the character yeah so uh i'll finish it one day but it's uh it i i have a lot of interest in different areas different genres but man i've um and i do other young adult stuff and kind of um i have a a children's book that I've been writing called Duncan, the flower breathing dragon. And okay. uh, I've been doing that for my daughter and she'll get it one day, one year for a birthday, much later than I intended, but uh, okay. she'll get it for a birthday one year. And um, <laughs> I love it. What is she I, pressuring you to finish the book yeah. already? <laughs> <laughs> no, she probably has forgotten it even exists, but right. uh, it'll happen one day and it'll be dedicated for her, you know, and nice. uh, 
but I've got so many characters and so many storylines and plot lines that I've developed over time that haven't necessarily gone places. Um, but this has been fun because the world of Packard Campbell in Endgame is he's a gamer. He's mm -hmm. uh, in fact, just a, just a small, small backstory for him is he's, he's dying of a, an incurable disease. His father, he's, he lost his mom at an early age. His father is um, takes the high road and decides to really bring his son into his life as closely as he can. Okay. So he has his son beta, beta test games that he develops through his company, individual gaming, which is where Endgame game came from. Okay. And, um, so Packard is testing these neural interface games, which I, I pulled a, a little bit from kind of the Philip K. Dick idea that memories can be implanted. So as as Packard is playing the games, he remembers the gaming as its real memories. So um, it uh, but the games that he plays are many of them are based on other properties that I've developed characters that I've developed concepts for storylines that I've developed. So as they come out, eventually it's kind of fun because they tie right back to the, the end game series in that kind of odd way where they're games in his world, but real to the characters in the, the other books. Yeah. If that makes sense. It, it does. I, I actually kind of like the whole testing out the game thing. Now, when you do these books and you, it, so that's the storyline, like what's your process in starting each story like you have this character and also you don't just do the one book you're you've already mentioned you do other books as well and, yeah uh, like what's your process going like okay today i'm going to write an end game story or not today but this year <laughs> but today you're gonna write a whole book in one day yeah. but you know th what's the process starting out with a, a story like that let's say end game well um i was I was inspired by, well, my, my son is 20. He's in fact, he'll be 21 in a few days actually. But, uh, I've, I've watched, I started out with games years ago. Mm -hmm. Um, as far as, I mean, I had an Atari when I was 10 I had a pong game when I think I was like six or seven <laughs> games have already been a piece of, of my life and where I haven't been a hardcore gamer. I don't have a Twitch channel or anything, which I should, but <laughs> I wouldn't you look it. like you should, I mean, you got a nice I, setup there. <laughs> uh, yeah, I guess I could actually, uh, yeah. but, uh, I, where I'm not a hardcore gamer, it's been a, a piece of me. So it inspired a lot of where the story came from. So in, in starting in game, it was fun to say, you know, what if this happens with a character? I, I have to throw out a little nod. One of my favorite teachers from high school, his name was Sid Waller. Okay. And, uh, he was my creative writing teacher and he started every class with, um, and this was be, this was in the 80s before fonts on computers, but he would start every class with a scripted what if on the board. It was always what if with a question mark and some ellipses, and it was always done in a different script so it would catch the eye. But uh, uh -huh. every class started out with the words what if. And so honestly, every creative process starts with what if. And if I have a, just the inkling of an idea, what would happen if this character was to do this? And I... I like you uh, saying about nanotech, I've always thought nanotech was fascinating. And I've had thoughts about, I was reading an article years ago about neural interfaces, what it would be like if, if characters could be, if you could play as a character in the game, but in your mind, mm -hmm. and it would be played out more like memories, more like a real event than hands on a, on a joystick. Um, you're controlling the events with your mind as much as the game can interface with that. Yeah. And I thought, and so for Packard, what happens is I thought this is the combination of the two. Mm -hmm. What if someone has those memories re-uploaded to them and the nanotech isn't sure what to do with the, the memories that could be real or could be organic or could be, or, you know, real or could be from within the games. Yeah. So, um, so it's, it, it is very dystopian. It is very Philip K. Dick in that regards, you know, like, what happens when nanotech is supposed to put these memories back into you, but it doesn't know which ones are real. Yeah. Um, to answer your question about how I get inspired. Um, you <laughs> That's know, one, you were still doing it. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, I feel like yeah, I was kind of heading that down that direction, but I just yeah. squirrel a bit like Packard in my books squirrels an awful lot. He's, yeah. he's not based at all on me. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, um, but once I've established that I've got something, once I've established that I, I have a, a character or a set of circumstances that I love. Um, honestly, they take root like a weed. Uh, the, the character grows, the, they become, and I mean, not in the psychotic way, like, oh, they're real, but they really do become real to me in the sense that I'm now 
they become a part of my process. They are living rent free in my mind. Mm -hmm. And I am, uh, I am thinking about where they go next constantly. And, um, so in writing the first book, um, once I had the idea that I wanted him to kind of be skipping through, through memories and have this confusion factor. And then of course, you know, kind of illustrate where he's headed with it. Mm -hmm. Um, I started immediately taking notes where I wanted to go in future books. And originally it was just going to be a trilogy. Um, and so I was putting notes for book two and book oh, three. Okay. All and right. I would say, this is where it's going to happen. About halfway through book one, I actually wrote the ending for the entire series. I know what happens to Packard. I know what happens to his. Oh, his so there is already an end in sight. Like it's not just going to be ongoing. Okay. All right. Well, then no, you can always do the prequels and you can do the, you yeah. know. Uh, yeah. Okay. I love the fact that that's been introduced into story arcs. Uh, because it's just such a way to go like, well, you know, I could keep extending this or I could show how it all began even more so or how people were affected on the outcome or you could do spinoffs. I wish I had that kind of focus because I'd be able to write more. Huh? Anyway, <laughs> it's, not easy. it's not it's not always easy, but sometimes sometimes the stories write themselves. Yeah. And I, you can probably relate to this again. Art is art is art, whether it's writing or music or, you know, right. or, or painting art is art. And, and I feel like um, and I. I feel like that doesn't get acknowledged nearly enough, um, whether it be, and I, I think it's just some people could be a, a, a literary snob or some people could be an, a, you know, an art snob or a music snob. They don't, and I, I don't like to use the term snob as much as just, but I you get know what I mean, mean though, like things have genre. to be this way. Yeah. Yeah. But they don't really look at the other arts as uh, the other forms of art as the same, but the, the process really isn't different. Once you're inspired and you're putting down that you're going through the process, mm -hmm. writing lyrics for a song is, I mean, holy cow, that's honestly, I could write a book before I could write. And I've, I've written lyrics for a song and it's fun, but yeah, it takes a whole different focus. You're, you're dealing with rhyming, you're dealing with keeping things contained and, and uh, it's like learning to write a good haiku, you know, it's right. like <laughs> yeah. five, seven, five and you're, and yet it's more difficult than writing a a chapter of a book. Yeah. And and there are times too, just like with what you were saying, there are some times where people go, I really like that song. And it's like, that's funny. That song, I, you know, I pumped that one out in a night, you know, in other ones where it's like, oh, that took us several months to do. Uh, yep. It's, it's the same sort of way. Sometimes it's just like everything worked and it's like, okay, cool. It's done. Right. Yes, it's done. Yeah. <laughs> and, and it, it didn't take long at all. Yeah. Man. It does happen. It's very true. Um, yeah. now with your books, uh, I mean, I know that you're doing, I mean, you're publishing. So actually this is a question for both you as an author and you as a publisher, how do you actually promote things? Like what's, uh, some of the process that you could share with people about like how you do actually get the word out there. And I mean, it's one thing to just go, Hey, we publish books and then we got a distributor, which is all fantastic. Right. But people still have to learn about it. You can make them. Doesn't mean everybody's going to buy them or know about them, you know? So how, no, how do no. you uh, promote things as a publisher and an author? Well, and as a very shallow pockets publisher, <laughs> I wish we, I don't I think that's I, that uncommon, but yes, <laughs> no, no, it really isn't there. There is more than I would like to do. You know, it's one of those things that as, and, and my wife and I, uh, in fact, I stepped down. I was, I, when I started this, I was CEO. I just, I thought, great. I'm going to start this. I'm going to, I have a lot of in, uh, knowledge in the industry, uh, knowledge about the industry. And so I'm going to do this myself. Um, found that um, as a creative soul, it's not always as easy to make the tough financial choices, oh, to yeah. make the tough business choices. Um, so my wife and I had a very real conversation about six months ago. And I said, um, you're the business mind, you know, you're, you're this. In fact, she's my editor. She's the, the she's the, the, the chief editor. And so I, uh, she's really logical. We always say she's the the Spock to my Kirk. I'm passionate. I run into danger, you know, with the fists in the air, screaming the injustice. And she goes, maybe perhaps we should think about this first. <laughs> and so as my uh, as my business partner, I said, you should just be CEO. I became CCO. So um, I just said all that to say that with more money, we did decide that as money comes in, it doesn't go to us. It goes back to the company so that we can market more effectively. Yeah. Um, and that was one of the other reasons we wanted to start off very small is that um, marketing is expensive oh, and yeah. getting things out there to be noticed is very expensive. And so 
a lot of the traditional routes haven't been available to us just being, you know, very, very small budget, but with intentions of growing. So, I mean, you have to either you start or you don't. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, if we waited until we had the money to do it the way we wanted to, it, you know, I'd either be retired or dead. So, okay. <laughs> so grim, uh, <laughs> right. <laughs> it just doesn't always happen. Right. So yeah. we started knowing that things would be definitely shoestring. Mm -hmm. Um, but social media is has been um, it has been wonderful for us. I you have to be very active and make sure. And some of it, I, I really let my Instagram kind of suffer for a while. Mm -hmm. But I'm I'm more active on Facebook. I've been pretty active on Twitter, um, and uh, in social media in general, getting things out there. My LinkedIn, I stay very active. I have a lot of connections in there okay. who know what we're doing, who follow it. Um, I know I'm forgetting something. Um, yeah, I it just social media itself is just it's it's such a boon, I think, for any independent or small publisher. And um, and then um, word of mouth is huge, making sure. But then things like this coming onto the podcast and yeah. being able to talk to people and get get the awareness out there. Um, I also have friends and contacts that I've had since I since my Hollywood days that I reach out to and say, hey, by the way, this is coming out. Um, you know, and, and they'll put it out with their social circle as well. So that doesn't hurt okay. being able to actually have some people who are, you know, ingrained in the industry saying, Hey, this book came out by this, this author or this publishing company that I know it's worth checking out. So, okay. And are you creating cool. landing pages for these individual books? Or are you sending them directly to the store where they're available? Like, how are you sending people to the sites? Cause I know there are different ways to go about that. And different, yeah. you know, uh, so what, I guess I'm curious what method you use to, to actually send people to a specific book. Well, I have a few different ways to get there. Okay. Um, and I figure the, the more, I don't want to get it convoluted where it, you know, it's like, well, I have no idea where I'm going or, you know, why I'm looking. Right. I'd rather funnel them. And, and I don't like the term funnel because I know whole, I like, hate that term too, but it's become, visually, it makes sense, but it's like, God, it just yeah. sounds like, you know, it, it sounds like hurting cows, you know, it, yeah. I don't, I don't like that, that term either, but. It's yeah. And it's just I think at this point, especially with the way marketing is done and and the term click funnel going into everything, it just oh, oh my goodness. Just so, yeah. Like, oh, and I don't have have landing pages per se that are just um, and it's um, I I try to keep it a little more organic. Having worked in SEO and knowing how. It can feel kind of it, I, I think people are savvy to that now. And when they see oh, yeah. like, oh, I'm I'm on a landing page, you're not giving me any options here, but to buy right. your book. Honestly, I the book may not be right for them. It may not be what they're really interested in once they get to it. I would much rather have people have, and I know it, it uh, you know, traditional thought says, oh, well, they may, be, they're going to leave you. Mm -hmm. Honestly, we're a publisher. We have different types of books. We have different, different authors okay. uh, with different genres. We have merchandise and whatnot. And, and, um, and in the marketplace that I've created, I actually figured it's going to be appealing to readers and writers. So I also put easy ways to find things like e-readers and, uh, oh, yeah. you know, and phones and, you know, and, uh, you know, an office refrigerator or something that may be useful to people who are actually busy doing the same thing. Um, so I'd rather bring them directly to a website where the book exists for sale, but there's other things to look at as well. That makes sense as a publisher as well. It's like, you know, even if they come there and they do click around any person who's on your publishing company list. I can't think of the way to put that. Anyone who you publish, there we go. That's what I meant to say. Mm -hmm. It would benefit, you know, it would benefit anyone that you're publishing to actually go through and like, oh, they like this one instead. What, uh, what kind of tips do you have for other writers out there uh, as far as the knowledge that you have as a publisher or as a writer? Like, what are some things you've learned along the way that you think you could share with people? Well, and, and not to use an old, I mean, gosh, every, I think everybody's heard the JK Rowling story, you know, right. 50, 50 no's before the 51st. Yes. Um, and I feel like that's, that can't be driven home enough. Um, first, first rule of writing is, and any art is don't give up. Yeah. There's somebody out there who wants to see what you're doing or read what you're doing or hear what you're playing. Um, it just, just because it's fallen on the wrong ears so far, doesn't mean that it it's not worthy mm -hmm. um the other thing is is always be open to real constructive criticism i think and i don't know how it is with art specifically but i would imagine with musicians um 
it's not much different, but having like a beta reader group or a beta listener group to I've say- I've heard hey, a lot of people hear, mention hear. that. Yeah. Uh-huh. And that to me is really important. Having a group of beta readers that you trust to actually give you real feedback. It's one thing to have your mom read it or, you know, or your spouse, <laughs> or your, yeah. you know, my kids are honest. If they read it and they'd be like, oh, this is awful, dad. You know, I, I <laughs> they would People tell me. People do so. say family members, whether it be wives or kids are always like brutally honest with them. And I'm like, wow. Yeah. You know, I would but it makes sense. that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, why would you want to release a piece of garbage just because your family <laughs> says it's great? But but I do find people from different walks of life. I have other authors that I, I have in my group. And usually by the time um, the beta reading is closed, I usually have somewhere in the neighborhood of a half a dozen that have completed it mm -hmm. and can give real honest feedback for, from start to finish. And that's huge. Um the other thing that I think is really important to say is that so many people say, do I need a publisher? You, you hear people say, why do I need a publisher? Do I need a publisher? Yeah. And the, um, the answer is maybe. Um, my advice is, because I think as a publisher, it's way too easy to say, of course you need a publisher. They're going to market you. They're going to do this and that. And, right. and too many publishers would automatically say that. Yeah, you need a publisher. Well, it's not going to be me because I, you know, and <laughs> that's right. an awful thing. But um, honestly, if someone is... The whole self-publishing thing is becoming more and more viable than it was, you know, 10 years ago, 20 years ago. I mean, mm -hmm. heck, even five years ago. It just keeps getting better, the options. My, my pitch for a publisher is if you're going to write more than one book, yeah, then having a publisher might be a good option for you because if you're writing one book, a self-help book, one novel, and... um I hate to use the word run one trick pony, but if that's your, if that's your idea, you have one thing that that's what you want to do and you're passionate about it and you don't have any aspiration to go beyond that, then um, having a publisher might just be a waste because now somebody is, is earning extra money off of what you've put out there. Um, you know, as someone who teaches a martial arts class, who has a book that they want to market about how to train martial arts or how to train in the discipline a publisher might be a waste of their money because mm -hmm. they could market that on their own. Your passion was put into that book and writing it, put the same passion into marketing it, sharing it, getting it out there. Yeah. The time yeah. that you spent uh, writing it now, spend it on social media and get it out there and, and be excited. If you are writing a series like I'm doing, or you have multiple books on the table and you know that this is going a long time, the problem with all that marketing is you could be spending time that you should be writing marketing. So it's, it really becomes a, a balance. You know, if you're not doing a lot of it, mm -hmm. market it yourself. You're nobody's going to be as passionate about marketing your own book as you will be. Yeah. Um, but if you're writing a series and, and a publisher can get in there and start helping you develop that following. Yeah. Then that's where it's worth it. And, and the one thing too, is uh, what I've heard from very many people is Yes, marketing themselves is what they would love to do, but also the drawback being they just don't have the time. I've heard so many people say they just wish they had more time to market it because they yeah. do spend so much time making it. And that is the yep. give and take of doing it yourself is making the time to actually put it out there or to find avenues to promote it. And even if you want to say it's it, truthfully, I think it's even harder if you decide not to advertise and you try to just do it through social networking and all that kind of stuff. I feel like that takes a lot more time to grow. Other people I know that I've met, it's or, or at least it does for me, because other people I've met, I've had so many conversations where they're like, I posted this one thing and all of a sudden it got really popular. And it's like, damn you. Um, yeah. <laughs> I mean, good yeah. for you, but how did that happen? And how do I do it? Um, right? so, so I always go more of the advertising route. And also because that's just my background. You know, it's that's what yeah. I know. So you said you have the series you're working on, and I just realized mm -hmm. I wanted to know how far along in the series are you, and when is this ending that you've uh, constructed already uh, ah. scheduled to happen? <laughs> yeah. Well, originally I had, I, I, it, by design, it was going to be three books. I was going down the trilogy route, you know, the, okay. the, the beginning, middle, end, you know, uh, act one, two, and three. Um, finished book one, and I realized... I between and knowing where I was going in book two, and I mean, as, again, as a creative person, you'll get this. I I feel like once you develop good characters, you realize I I have to do something with them, and I three books isn't going to be enough. 
and so or two more books to okay. wrap this up so um it's it's definitely going to end up at least four probably five books at this point and um it could end up going further i feel like when stephen king was writing the uh, nope not comparing myself to the king but <laughs> <laughs> but i feel like when stephen king was writing the dark tower he really didn't know how many books there were going to be or where it was going to end specifically okay and it wasn't until he was in that awful accident getting hit by the van that he finally goes i gotta, I gotta finish this <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> i might not make it to the end myself yeah i was gonna um, give you the example of dan Harmon, where he came up with the adage six seasons in a movie you know so <laughs> there's that too there you go. Yeah. I, like he went beyond the trilogy and was like six seasons in a movie, um, <laughs> you know? So uh, anyway, when do you think the actual ending is going to happen or do you think it's still going to evolve? Not um, that I'm trying to ask you to finish your, geez, no. that makes it sound like I'm going be done already. <laughs> no, no. Um, actually, no. And that actually, uh, that you, that goes back to a question that you had asked uh, about kind of like the process before. Yeah. Um, and um, actually we, I, and again, as a business, doing this as a business and not just as a hobby, right. uh, we had to kind of lay out what are, what is our release de schedule now. So we have like our little our little uh, tree set up that's kind of like when you look at the Marvel releases over the next several years. Oh yeah, um, and we've put book titles into the into our little into our little tree here and said, so when are things going to come out? We decided, especially with young adult titles, um, I don't want my audience to age out before the books finish oh, at, at least i want to keep them interesting enough that if they do age at least mm -hmm. i mean then they, they, they will um that the books will age with them in interest okay. um i love what rowling did with harry potter in that the first book was little kids like magic it's so much fun you know right. and they might as well have been ash and pokemon like i choose you <laughs> um but by the last book it's danger you yeah. know, they've grown up, they've lost people that they loved. They've, they've learned that their actions have consequences, that there are people out there who will hurt them. Mm -hmm. And, um, that's, uh, uh, to me, that was, that was, an, uh, I, I wanted to take a, a page from her book in that regard of <laughs> growing the characters or growing the tension with the books. And so, um, we have scheduled out how the books are going to grow, but, uh, back to the the timing we've decided that each of the books is going to come out nine nine months apart nice uh, okay to keep them to keep the flow going to keep the audience interested and um and in between there's a another young adult series uh, called the evolutions which is a part of edmund j gray's uh book series that we're releasing in between so there will be young adults books coming out technically every four and a half months for the next several years. So nice. But end game uh, will come out every nine months for the next four to five years. Wow. That's impressive. So. I'm, yeah. That's a nice timeline. You've wow. You've padded that out really well. That's good. I'm, I'm sorry. I, that was just really impressive. Damn. <laughs> anyway. Um, so if people did want to check out your books and the publishing company, where would you suggest that they go to find out more about this? So the publishing company is epiphanymill.com. It's the word epiphany and then mill, like a, like a paper mill. Mm -hmm. um, and, but we went a little clever with the, uh, the, the marketing on it. We, we, we have a, a place where they can buy merchandise called the Epiphany Mall. So it's <laughs> epiphanymall.com. Um, so if they want to find the book, epiphanymall.com is probably the best place to go. Uh, to find anything about Epiphany Mill uh, or submissions or finding out about the other authors, epiphanymill.com would be the place to go. Okay. So, and if anybody's interested in just knowing any more about me, uh, rodrgarcia.com is there too. So, great. Well, I want to thank you so much for being on the show today. It was great getting a chance to meet you. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Tom.